Nile Red, the biggest chemistry YouTuber, known for turning inedible objects and P into edible compounds. But can we trust him? For all we know, whatever he shows us could be literally anything. Even if we do trust him, trust is mostly irrelevant to science. Instead, we should use the most important pillar of science, reproduction, which you will often see being called peer review, and we can use that to see if Nile Red is telling the truth or not. At the same time, by using our combined two brain cells of power, we can also improve on the procedure. We saw Nile Red at multiple failed attempts at the synthesis of benzaldehyde using the ATAR reaction in his most recent video, likely due to some small mistakes that ended up ruining the whole experiment, which is quite typical for chemistry. And there is some art in finding and fixing them, which often requires advanced knowledge of chemistry acquired through many years of suffering. So for this video, I will first reproduce his chromochloride synthesis, and then his latest video's benzaldehyde synthesis, where the chromochloride is needed, and at the same time, see if I can find and fix some of his errors, and improve the procedure, or at least highlight some of them. So to get started with the chromochloride synthesis, I set up a flask in a heating mantle on a stir plate. I drop in a stir bar, and I then weigh out 50 grams of potassium dichromate, and separately, 32 grams of sodium chloride. Now I'll just mix them so that the reactivity is improved. Contrary to what Nile Red did, you don't have to powder them in a blender and mix them like that. We can do it in a better way, which will limit any unnecessary transfer and dust of the dichromate. If we just add a good access of the liquid reagent, in this case sulfuric acid, the stir bar will eventually start working and do it a lot better than if you were to powder them and then not add a stir bar like he did. I have pre-chilled some concentrated sulfuric acid in the freezer, which will help in keeping the reaction tame at the beginning, so that it can all be added at once. I just add a random excess, and the first bit I use to wash out the beaker, in which I have mixed the powders. Immediately upon addition, it starts fuming, and becoming a smoldering pit of hell. I add more sulfuric acid, and then quickly attach a short path distillation apparatus. I then start heating it to a boil to increase the reaction rate and make the chromochloride distill over. After a short while, the stir bar starts to come loose and it begins to mix normally. What is happening are three different reactions. At first, concentrated sulfuric acid reacts with potassium dichromate to form potassium sulfate, chromium trioxide and water. Concentrated sulfuric acid also reacts with sodium chloride to form sodium hydrogen sulfate and hydrogen chloride. Chromium trioxide and hydrogen chloride then react to form chromochloride and water. I'm not an inorganic chemist, but if it is legal to use organic chemistry reaction mechanism logic on inorganic compounds, we can draw the formation of the chromochloride in the following way. One of the oxygens from chromium trioxide picks up a proton from the hydrogen chloride, forcing one pair of bond electrons to move onto the oxygen to balance its charge. The hydrogen chloride bond electrons move onto the chlorine, which then attacks the chromium. The intermediate molecule with a hydroxyl group again picks up a proton, and chlorine again attacks the chromium, after which the protonated hydroxyl is immediately kicked off as water. In the end, we are left with chromochloride and water as our products. The reverse reaction can also take place, where chromochloride reacts with water, but it is mostly sequestered by the concentrated sulfuric acid, which prevents the water from reacting as well as distilling over. While it was ongoing, I added some extra sodium chloride, just in case. As the temperature increases, the blood red vapors start getting more intense, and a lot of fumes are escaping from the apparatus. I insulate it with some aluminum foil to trap the heat so that it distills over more easily. After a while, the devil's juice starts coming over at a decent rate. I then just waited until it pretty much stopped coming over. At that point, the apparatus is still filled with dark red vapors, and I move it off heat. I then take off the receiving flask and quickly stopper it. I just left the apparatus to fume and cool down for a second and then cleaned it all with water. The yield of the chromochloride turned out to be 47.1 grams, or 89%, which is higher than the yield Nile Red got in this video. I assigned the difference mostly to the improved mixing with the stir bar. In his video, he had some black chunks in his product, which he filtered out. I see some very tiny specks that are stuck to the glass, but it's not really significant, so I won't bother filtering it, and it doesn't matter for the next reaction. Now that the chromochloride is ready, I can start the next reaction. Since he used carbon tetrachloride as a solvent, I will also use it, which I happen to have recently purified in one of my shorts. For the toluene, I will just use some from a random local store, which apparently already has quite a low water content. So I will use it as is, instead of drying it like now. 
So to get started, I set up a water bath and put in a flask with a stir bar. To that, I add 16.4 grams of toluene. And then 65 mL of carbon tetrachloride as a solvent. I attach an adapter with a small dropping funnel, because unfortunately I broke my big dropping funnel. So this will have to do. Now I will also dilute the chromochloride with the same solvent, to have a tamer reaction. So I just mix 75 mL of carbon tetrachloride directly in the flask with the chromochloride. Since the dropping funnel is too small to hold it all at once, I will add it in two portions. So first I add about 50 mL of the chromochloride solution to the dropping funnel. Now Red Setup also had a condenser with a drying tube, and a thermometer but I think the condenser is especially unnecessary if we already know that the temperature is maintained normally at a slow addition rate. And if we also know that, we don't have to add a thermometer again. The reaction doesn't produce any pressure, so we can just stopper the dropping funnel and have it closed from air and moisture. Some of the liquid already slips through the pressure equalizing arm of the dropping funnel into the flask, but it doesn't really matter. It immediately turned black and I just continued the addition slowly. The proportion of the reagents is something to note. In this case, now red actually used a slight excess of toluene, while in general, it is better to have an excess of chromochloride instead. But I will do it like him anyway. If we have too little chromochloride, we increase the likelihood of side products. In this reaction, the chromochloride reacts with toluene to form the corresponding ATAR complex. What happens is that one of the oxygens picks up a proton from the methyl group, of which the bond electrons form a double bond, causing the aromatic ring to attack the chromium, forming this intermediate. The other oxygen then attacks the double bond, and the double bond electrons move back into the ring to reform the more stable aromatic ring. This causes the carbon chromium bond electrons to move onto the chromium. We are then left with an intermediate ATAR complex, which reacts with another chromochloride molecule in the exact same fashion to give the final ATAR complex with two chromium centers. This product precipitates out as a brown solid. When the addition was finished, I stoppered it and left it stirring overnight. I then come back the next day and a bunch of brown solid is suspended in the liquid. So I set up a glass fit with a filter paper and wet it with some carbon tet. I then filter the whole reaction mixture through, and we can see it is still letting off some fumes. I wash out the flask with more carbon tetrachloride, and also wash the residue with more carbon tet. I stir it around and let it dry on the filter for a second, and then move it all to a crystallizing dish. The product just looks like dirt, and it also fumes a bit. There's probably still some unreacted chromochloride soaked into the solid, as well as carbon tet, which also explains why the weight is more than the maximum possible yield. Now it didn't show its yield for this step, but it doesn't really matter if it's still wet. Now for the next step, we will destroy the complex to give benzaldehyde. So I set up a large beaker with a stir bar and add in a bunch of water. I then saturate the water with sodium sulfide, which will reduce any toxic chromium-6 to the more friendly chromium-3. Unlike now red, I will add some sodium hydroxide with the sodium sulfide, because any unreacted chromochloride will also react with water, to form chromic acid and hydrochloric acid. And we saw in this video, it is best to make the pH a bit basic, to be able to extract the benzaldehyde. One possibility why acid might be a problem, is because the acid reacts with sodium sulfide, to form sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide then reacts with sodium sulfide, to form sodium metabisulfide, which in solution, forms sodium bisulfide which can react with the benzaldehyde to form a complex that stays in the water layer and thus can't be extracted. Anyhow, I first add a little bit of the complex to the solution and see what it does. It sizzles a bit and slowly becomes a transparent green color from the reduced chromium. Just to keep the temperature down, I will set it in this water bath with some cooling packs because I ran out of ice. I then gradually add all of the complex to the beaker. In this reaction, the complex is hydrolyzed to benzaldehyde. I couldn't find any literature on how exactly this works. So I cooked something up that might be possible, but take it with a grain of salt. The oxygen picks up a proton from water, after which it is kicked off forming this chromium compound and a carbocation intermediate. This intermediate is attacked by the formed hydroxide ion. In the resulting intermediate, the second oxygen steals the proton from the hydroxyl group, and it is also kicked off. The oxygen-hydrogen bond electrons move to form a carbonyl double bond, leaving us with benzaldehyde. The formed chromium compound likely reacts with water too, to form a chromium-3 compound. Towards the end of the addition, a bunch of the chromium salt suddenly precipitated, and stayed suspended, so potentially it could be filtered to make the extraction easier. Maybe adding more base would redissolve it, but I didn't try it. After leaving it to stir for a second, I set up a separatory funnel and transferred the mixture in portions. 
I then add some diethyl ether to extract the benzaldehyde and then mix the layers. The separation is quite poor because of all the solids floating around, so I separate them more roughly. I also add some water to the last bit to get better separation. I then extract all of the mixture twice with diethyl ether. I then move all the combined extracts to the separatory funnel and the chromium junk that came along. I then wash it with water and a saturated salt water solution. A bunch of the chromium stuff still floats around, but it's not a problem. I just take the combined washed ether extracts and add a bunch of anhydrous sodium sulfate to it. This will hold all the water that came along, as well as the chromium junk in it. I then set up a flask in the heating mantle with a funnel and plug it with some cotton. I filter the mixture through to get rid of the solid stuff again. I drop in a stir bar and set it up for short path distillation to distill off the ether. When most of the ether is gone, I stop the distillation and immediately continue with the next step, which still works fine, even if there's ether present. Now red just evaporated all completely, but it isn't strictly necessary. So to the ether solution containing the benzaldehyde, I add an excess of a saturated solution of sodium bisulfide. It takes a while for the reaction to be complete, so I just leave it overnight. In this reaction, the benzaldehyde reacts with the sodium bisulfide to form the corresponding bisulfide adduct. Aldehydes in general, as well as methyl ketones, react with the sodium bisulfide to form a bisulfide adduct, which can be used to isolate and purify these two types of molecules. The way it works is that the bisulfide ion is weakly nucleophilic, which is only strong enough to attack an aldehyde or methyl ketone carbonyl carbon. After the attack, one of the electron pairs from the carbonyl double bond moves onto the oxygen, which then takes up a proton from the bisulfide. Those bond electrons then move to make a sulfur-oxygen double bond to balance the charge on the sulfur, giving the final bisulfide adduct. When I come back the next day, a bunch of white solid has precipitated, which should be the bisulfide adduct. I set up a glass fit with a filter paper again and filter it all through. I wash it out and down with ether to remove the impurities that are still soluble in the ether, while the benzaldehyde stays behind on the filter as the bisulfide adduct. I leave it to dry on the filter for a second so that the ether evaporates. I then move it all to a crystallizing dish. The yield of the bisulfate adduct turned out to be 5.9 grams, which is 19% calculated from the chromochloride. Now Red didn't say what his yield was. As a creator, I understand that he left out the yield. As a chemist, fuck you. Moving on with the next step, where we destroy the bisulfate adduct to return the benzaldehyde. So I set up a separatory funnel again and add in a saturated solution of sodium carbonate. I then add in all of the bisulfide adduct. I shake it strongly and add some more sodium carbonate because he did it too. I also add some diethyl ether to already start extracting the benzaldehyde. What happens is that the base reacts with the bisulfide adduct to return the benzaldehyde. The sodium carbonate made it clog, so I add some water to loosen it. I then separate the layers and extract the water layer one more time with more ether. Now I have the combined ether extracts that should contain the benzaldehyde, to which I add some sodium sulfate again to absorb remaining droplets of water. I again set up a flask in a heating mantle with a funnel that I plug with some cotton and filter all of the ether through. I add a tiny stir bar and then distill off all of the ether. When all the ether is gone, some liquid is left behind that should be benzaldehyde. I pipette it all into a vial and it seems to be a bit cloudy, possibly from some water that is remaining. Now Red uses an NMR machine to confirm his product, but I'm not rich like that, so I will use my god-given olfactory sensors to confirm the presence of benzaldehyde. The test turned out to be positive with a delicious almond smell, so I will give Now Red the seal of approval for reproducibility. I'm not going to taste it though, since I didn't use new squeaky clean glassware like Now Red does for his edible chem. And this might actually be the worst synthesis in existence for benzaldehyde with these shit yields. So I recommend everyone to never do this. See ya.